I'm Jared Bowen. Coming up on Open Studio, the poignant and provocative self-portraits of Lyle Ashton Harris. Then we captured the inaugural impressions the Obama portraits made on their stop in Boston. Oh, literally, when I walked in, I got chills. I felt very proud. The first thing I said was, oh my God, this is so dope, um, seeing black people represented in this way. Plus, a renewed art form steps forward with Step Africa. <laughs> It's all now on Open Studio. First up, Lyle Ashton Harris is an artist who uses self-portraiture as a way to ultimately turn the lens on society, creating images that make us look at ourselves as much as we're looking at him. That work and much more is now on view at the Rose Art Museum in an exhibition that spans his 35-year career. Lyle Ashton Harris, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for having me. I'm so your show is titled it. Our First and Last Love at the Rose, and you're, you're all over the show, which, which sounds like a weird thing to say because, of course, every artist has created their work, but this is so much about you. It is of you. It's your history. So describe for me what the show represents to you. The title itself, um, Our First and Last Love, is actually from a fortune cookie. Um, I was in... Um, um, Pike's Market in Seattle in 91 with my former partner, a soulmate of mine, Tommy Gear, and his mother had recently died, so we were visiting from L.A., and that was a fortune cookie um, that um, we were having Chinese food um, that, that evening. And so that fortune made its way into my journal, and two years later, it became the source material for a... Um, ruby red neon that I created um, for this Creative Times, um, I think 1992, 42nd Street Art Projects. Well, it strikes me as an, an apt title as well because our first and last love, going back to my first question, we see you looking back at your younger self throughout this exhibition and in the shadow boxes we see your history, photographs, notes, uh, pieces of you even in one instance. So what is the conversation you're having with yourself? Well, that's a good question. It is true that there is a strong autobiographical or self-citational aspect to the work, but I question the works definitely speak to the period of this particular time that we actually live in. So there are references to popular culture, um, various historical moments um, throughout history, etc. So I think in a way that they definitely use the self, if you will, to go through a series of experiments to really talk about us, our collective um, lives and histories, but also references to art history, etc. So clearly an autobiographical sense, but with our question engaging with both social and art, art, art history. Well, that makes me wonder in in the self-portraiture that we see where, where you're assuming different identities, is that equally as much about you as you looking at our collective society in that moment, or are those more about you? Very good question. If there's one image in particular I would highlight, and that's, say, Michael Stewart, which is a work from 1994. As you know, Michael Stewart was killed by New York's police um, in the train station. So although it is a portrait of me wearing a police uniform, it's more about an exorcism. It's, in a way, it's art as a way to somehow bring up both social and cultural issues. So again, I don't see it necessarily about me per se, but the idea of the sacrificial, what does it mean? As the late great poet, my friend Essex Hemphill said, they use a body as a uh, canvas, if you will, to explore issues. And now um, the Boston um, community has an opportunity to see the work um, say Michael Stewart, in the flesh, so to speak. Well, you're talking about the power of photography and what it represents and how visceral it can be for people. I'm struck by, again, going back to your history, your grandfather and his love and prowess with photography and how that has filtered down. What did you take away from what your grandfather did? Very good question. Uh, my grandfather um, was... Um, an economist at the Port Authority, but as you know, he shot over 10,000 slides, ectochrome to be exact, um, over a period of, let's say, let's say four decades, you know, starting in the, the late 50s, and documenting his friends, family, community, etc. 
Um, my, both my brother and I, my brother's a filmmaker, award-winning filmmaker, Thomas Allen Harris, has mined that archive. In fact, my brother's films through the lens darkly um, about black photography has mined that work, as well as my first show, The Good Life, where I juxtapose images my grandfather had taken of the community with contemporary images. So it is fascinating me around, it's fascinating to me how these um, family archives and the way that Bell Hooks talks about within segregated South, all that was from the North, the fact that it's within these repositories of the family that black culture got to be preserved, if you will. So I think in a way um, that archive of my grandfather's gives sort of a, um, a narrative history, but also allows us to join the past as we imagine, imagine the future. Staying with family for a moment, there's one photograph of you and your brother in the show. Yes, Brotherhood Crossroads, etc., from 1994 as well. There's a lot to experience in that photograph. Yeah. What, what? Well, tell us about it. I do. <laughs> for some reason, I had a feeling that you would put it back on me. It, on yeah. first viewing, it looks this this, this purity of love. Mm -hmm. And then you understand it's two brothers. Yes. Well, I mean, to describe the photograph, it's from... The Good Life from 1994, my first um, New York um, gallery show. The whole gallery exhibition was based on um, Marcus Garvey's UNIA tricolor flag. Most people date the red, black, and green flag to the 70s, but it was actually accepted by Marcus Garvey as the official flag for the black race in the 1917, I believe. Around the time I was working on that project, there was an editorial in the New York Times by... Um, um, the great um, Alice um, Walker, who spoke about uh, the Black Panthers and the difficulties it was in terms of men to love other men. So not in the sense of being queer, but the idea of the homosocial. And so that it was easier to, for one man to annihilate another as opposed to see that they shared common um, themes of love, brotherhood, etc. So that photograph speaks to that in a way that we are exchanging, let's say, a kiss. Again, it's about two brothers who are sacrificially trying to explore these issues against the backdrop of the UNIA flag. And the photograph has been written about cover of books and artists all historical dissertations at Harvard, Yale, Cambridge, or wherever. The photograph is highly cited. But it is interesting as it, the potency of what does it mean for two men, two brothers, to be exchanging a kiss, but also the exchange of the penetration of the gun, which has its echoes in Cain and Abel, if you think biblically, or Caravaggio, if you think about um, the, the, the doubting Thomas. So I'm interested in all those the configuration of all those elements coming together and distilled within one image and, and the potency of that to elicit, if you will, conversation as well as dissertations. Well, as you, you, you echoed for me, I have been thinking about it nonstop the whole show. It, this is, we barely scratched the surface here, but it, people need to spend so much time with it. There is so much to absorb. Thank you for your time today. Well, thank you so much. It's a pleasure being here. Next, as we head into President's Day weekend, we take another look at the Obama portraits, which made their way to the Museum of Fine Arts last October during a national tour. To me, it is historical. It's groundbreaking. Uh, I love the contemporary um, perspective, but also bringing in the history and what is important to the president. I like the flowers that are represented in it, the natural environment, and just a different take than what we think of portraits. There's this long history of photography and photographs excluding the African American experience. Frederick Douglass, I think, was one of the first to get his portraits done and to be staring right into the camera, to see the president staring right out front and the first lady Michelle Obama looking straight out in front. It's powerful. I feel like the representation of Michelle doesn't get across her warmth and kind of her accessibility, even though I know that's what the artist Amy Sherald was looking to portray, but it doesn't show her humanity as much as I wish it did. The portrait of Barack Obama is more it feels like he's really looking at you, wanting to know what you're thinking. 
I love the technique that the, the grays that the artist used to depict her, and I really, really loved it. Yeah, the photorealism was pretty cool. The, the background kind of sticking over Barack's picture was really pretty neat. And the, the colors were just so vibrant. In, in contrast to each other, it's pretty cool, too, to see the two different techniques, two different styles, just completely different. They're beautiful. They're absolutely beautiful. They're, like, chilling. I got goosebumps. Kehinde Wiley is a phenomenal painter, obviously. Like, his work is absolutely beautiful, and then Amy as well. I think she captured Michelle Obama beautifully. Seeing these pictures up close was just amazing. I didn't think that it was going to look the way that it did, nor did I realize the size difference, you know, on your phone versus in person. I remember the portraits coming out, and I remember people liking the one of Michelle less, and so the choice to kind of make her in the tradition of formal portraiture, which is a little bit more like I am powerful and I am a little bit removed, is like disjoint with our public image of her. But it's absolutely in the tradition of powerful leaders, right, of which Michelle is obviously one as well. His face is so strong and he's so open with his collar open and leaning into the picture. And I, I walked around and his eye contact was with me the whole way. I really felt that he drew me into really listening and communication in a strong and compassionate way. And I loved it that such a strong person could sit in a floral arrangement representing all the places that he had lived. I wanted to cry. He's an incredible president. And for me, who has a daughter, who dreams big, to see the president and first lady dream big and share that dream with everyone. They never give up, they never divide, and they're always like, come on for the ride and inspire. Oh, literally, when I walked in, I got chills. I felt very proud. The first thing I said was, oh my God, this is so dope. Um, seeing black people represented in this way and in such a great museum as this and like people paying money to come in and see this and like the elevation of black art that we've seen in the last few years has been something that I hope continued the trajectory. Happy. There is a joy to them. I was in tears when he won the election the first time, let alone the second time. And um, that same kind of joy definitely comes through in the paintings. Same, same feeling. It's nice to see someone being different, right? Like, it's not the traditional stuffy picture, so it's, it's just a little bit of awe and a little bit of uh, pride in, in seeing things evolve and being different. When I started reading the notes on leadership and just reflecting on what I'm looking at, I've got tears in my eyes because I think that as, as a black woman in America, it's hard, you know, and to see these influences and these leaders, you know, portrayed in this way is beautiful. Finally, we continue our Black History Month coverage with Step Africa, the dance company that blends percussive dance styles practiced by historically African-American fraternities and sororities with traditional African dance. We bring you a conversation I had last October with C. Brian Williams, founder and executive producer of Step Africa. I caught up with him in Boston when the company's production of Jump Folk was presented by Arts Emerson. <laughs> See, Brian Williams, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, thank you. You can just call me Brian. Well, tell, tell me how this dance first came to resonate with you. Well, stepping is a really unique art form, and Step Africa is the first professional company in the world dedicated to this tradition. I first learned how to step uh, on, on the campus of Howard University in 1989. <laughs> The only way to access the tradition is if you joined a fraternity, a historically black fraternity, or a sorority. I'm curious about your knowing of it, knowing mm. that it wasn't so public. So how, did you know of it and you sought it out? What was, how public was it? No, that's a really good question because I didn't know a lot about stepping 
before I got to Howard University. I never actually even seen the art form practice. Most Americans still have not been introduced to the tradition of stepping because for most of its existence, it has been in a, a part of a closed community. How did it come to being and why was it closed? When African Americans first began to attend colleges, uh, majority white colleges at the time, um, they weren't allowed to be fully integrated into student life. So they created their own fraternities and sororities. And these, place, these frats and sororities were safe places for students during these you know, very volatile times in American history. They decided to express themselves in a very uniquely African way uh, when they chose to de demonstrate their love and pride to a broader community. They began to sing songs, do movements and align our circle. And this, these movements and practices grew into what we now know as the art form of stepping. And so our newest production, Drum Folk, goes even deeper into why we step in the first place, and we found some fascinating things uh, in that process. How much is it about the, the body and what the body can do and express? Stepping for me is about the body becoming the drum. But the real question for me was, why did we have to use the body as a drum? Why didn't we just play the drum? At what point in African American experience did we start to use the body as a drum? And that's what led us to the Stonewall Rebellion of 1739 and the Negro Act of 1740. Both of these events are what our latest production, Drum Folk, is in, are, are based on. What happened in 1739? Well, it's a wild time in American history. It's uh, 1739 in South Carolina. Um, the institution of slavery is alive and well sadly, and Africans are fighting against the tradition. They're rejecting uh, uh, the injustice that slavery was. So they lead a rebellion. Uh, word has it that they, uh, they use their drums as a way to call others to fight. They became very concerned that the drum and that, the, and that African people were going to resist even further. So they passed a set of laws, later became known as the Negro Act of 1740, that took away the right for Africans to use the drum. And for us, once the drum has disappeared from African people, the body and other instruments become the drum. So you have been immersed in this for almost 30 years, yeah. and to have this new history, how does that inform you? Oh, so it's exciting for me. It's so exciting because it's like, it reminds you about how many stories we still don't know. And for me in particular as an African American, how African American culture developed here and what are some of the clues that we can discover along the way. So then you go to Africa and you spend time there yeah. and you see the art form, not the same art form, but the art of dance there. How did you make the connection? The year after I graduated from Howard University in Washington, D.C., I went to uh, Southern Africa to live and study. And it's there that I became, was introduced to traditional South African forms and dance styles that were really inspiring and very exciting to me. One in particular was the South African gum boot dance. Salute! So I saw this dance, it's created by men who worked in the mines of South Africa, and it's also percussive. The drum is absent, the men are using their hands and their feet to make music, so it's strikingly similar to stepping. But I never heard of the form, and likewise, they had also never heard of stepping. So the idea was to bring the two art forms together. Stepping, meet the South African gum boot dance, hence the name Step Africa. And what does it mean for you to do it today? You know, today it's about preserving and promoting the art form. You know, Step Africa is here uh, as one of the largest African -Amer American dance companies in the world today. We're here to preserve and promote this uniquely American art form. The performance for me um, basically goes all the way from 1739 to today. 
and audiences will see the evolution of a form really in this performance. How key is the audience? And in many, in, in many performance venues, the audience is passive. Is that the case here? Well, as soon as Step Africa hits the stage, we are looking to connect and engage the audience. I mean, we really want the audience to feel free to make music, to talk, to share, to yell, to scream. I don't care what they do with the artist. How were the Obamas as an audience? You were at the White House. Uh, we were the featured uh, performer at Obama's Black History Month reception. Performing in the White House was uh, an honor. And I also love going all across our country, sharing this art form with uh, all Americans. Well, speaking of all Americans, I wonder what it was like to bring men and women together, because mm. it started in sororities and fraternities, not together. I don't know if you've seen School Days. When Spike that, Lee. Ask Spike Lee. Introducing the first of all black Greeks, the men of distinction, the brothers of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. When that movie came out, it really introduced fraternity and sorority life to a broad swath of American culture, of Americans. And you started to see the, the art form of stepping then being introduced in high schools, and middle schools, and elementary schools, and kind of step teams sprouted all around the country. So I, mean, I actually love that, because what it means is that the art form has grown. I don't think I've ever had the opportunity to ask an artist about something that is, uh, about an art form that is so new. And here you mm -hmm. are, you're, you're preserving it, you're curating it, you're, you're, you're taking care of it. That's what this 29, 30 year journey has been about exploring the art form and determining, you know, we've, we've merged stepping with symphonies, with rock music, with Appalachian clogging, Irish step dancing, with Israeli folk dance, with traditional African dances from all of, from Tanzania to West Africa to really everywhere in the world. We just got back from Bolivia, collaborating with indigenous culture there. So we are really, the art form to us is a way to connect and create. And that's what's motivated us all these years. Well, Brian, thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure to be with you. Thank you. Thank you for your questions and thank you for the interview. And that is all for this edition of Open Studio. Next week, make way for the creative team behind Make Way for Ducklings, the musical. You can always visit us online at gbh.org slash openstudio. And you can see us first on youtube.com slash gbhnews. Remember to follow us on Instagram and Twitter at openstudio.gbh. I'm at the Jared Bowen. We hope to see you here next week. Until then, I'm Jared Bowen. Thanks for joining us. Every Friday, Jim Browdy and Marjorie Egan offer up live performances on Boston Public Radio. So we leave you now with hip-hop artist Paul Willis, who performed in the inaugural Dorchfest Music Festival. I went from Jamaica Plain all the way to Bodega Bay. Things were straight from 1987 and 98. Then the hits came and it's changed with the quickness. When I was 12, my grandma's diagnosed with a sickness. See, books is black and white. My school was black and white. One of 13 blacks who could bridge that divide. No disrespect, my friends were upper middle class with intellect, stunting in class, cause being street was easy to expect. Black but not hood enough, smart but not good enough, leader cause I've lost so much that I could erupt. It's only a matter of time for I was out of my mind. Every summer was reckless, my mom was out of a job. Brothers in and out the house, some were friends, others foes, squares tried to keep me boxing. I stay on my toes, praying to the load. Is this my ceiling or my flow? Can't open the next door until the last one's closed cause this is straight from my book of rhymes. My book of rhymes, this is straight from my book of rhymes. My book of rhymes, this is straight from my book of rhymes. My book of rhymes, this is straight from my book of rhymes. My book of rhymes. I almost drowned when I was seven. And I heard the waves that changed the ships. Belly of the beast, I was losing it. Grandma sacrificed hospital nights was a crucifix. My mama sacrificed by her dad on some voodoo. Shh. 
It seems like the dark runs in the family. Veins suffocate by blood clot when you hang with me. Stick and move, kick the kitchen stool, which is brew. I got miles to go before I sleep. Comfortable, still I have no fear. Should have been dead, but it is so clear. There's something more that's meant for me than what I know here. And watch the sun grow into Apollo. Just because you claim to be a leader doesn't mean I will follow dreams stuck in between a couple ounces in a bottle, barely hanging on now. Why would I care about tomorrow? Cause I let my future bright with the past full of sorrow. I hope I can feel what's been hollow. Cause this is straight from my book of rhymes. My book of rhymes. This is straight from my book of rhymes. My book of rhymes. This is straight from my book of rhymes. My book of rhymes. This is straight from my book of rhymes. My book of rhymes. Now, the green awaits. Couldn't sleep away those dream of days. You couldn't ride through Bromley Heath without a key to stay. Summer heat ablaze, my OGs kept their beef away From the kids who couldn't claim the corners they patrolled Had to move through clicks trying to crack the code No one knew where I lived, see that was tactical I'm practically an anomaly, actual dramatic comedy Miracle I made it out based on my geography Constantly going back, I know my hood is proud of me Even when we once weren't free, they're not allowed to be See, the murals are coming down, and hollow became Whole Foods. I used to know all of my neighbors, and now I have no clue. Like the scar next to my left eye, I couldn't see this coming. Fighting to survive, they hated black kids busting. Ain't it something? My grandma owned a house when the neighborhood was Jewish. Now I can't recognize it as I walk through it. So this is straight from my book of rhymes. My book of rhymes. This is straight from my book of rhymes. My book of rhymes. This is straight from my book of rhymes. My book of rhymes. This is straight from my book of rhymes. My book of rhymes. Now I'm a rebel without a cause. Eleven in my catalog. I invest so I bet on me. That's what I can afford. And the people love it. They applaud of their own accord. Can write me off why I chart my course. I know I haven't made it yet, dream big, the craziest, futurist debated, best playing safe, ain't the safest bet, but underestimated, took losses when I played my best, but no regrets, it's all part of the test, life blessed me with a gift, I'm very diplomatic also, I counted every punch with jabs and hooks to the torso, I seen the best in life, cause I know it when it's awful, I'm not black thought, I'm thoughtful, wishing you were more so, lyrics like hieroglyphics were written in the source code, my hope is the music brings you peace in your war zone.